you to all of these uh, ladies, and then each one will kind of give you a little bit of information about them, about themselves, and then uh, we will open it up to a conversation. That's why we're here to learn from you all. So Tricia. Tricia Clark is an emergency response advisor for Ar Aramco Services, and she manages mar maritime operational risks and business resilience. Joy Hall is the Marine Training Director for Conoco Phillips Polar Tankers and is responsible for the development of a comprehensive marine training program. Probably not too many polar tankers floating around here, but I guess we've got other we've got a lot of other things. Um, Captain Sherry Hickman is a pilot for the Houston Pilots Association and expertly navigates vessels through the Houston Ship Channel, which is a challenge. It's kind of like 610, right? <laughs> Um, Aaron, Aaron Bertrand is um, MEBA Gulf Coast Vice President and leads operations at the company's Houston Union Hall. Captain Lindsay Price is a captain at G&H Towing Company and focuses on crew safety, cargo, security, and exceptional maneuvering and boat handling skills. And Samina Mahmoud serves as the Director of Communications for Vessel Services of O'Brien's Response Management and manages marketing and communications. So, we have our entire Viking team of ladies here. And I'm gonna start, I'm gonna, I guess we'll start over here, and maybe we can work our way down and everybody just kind of give us a little bit of information about what you do, and then we will open it up and start talking. Thank you. All right, good evening. Uh, my name is Erin Bertram. I'm a 1991 graduate of the Texas Maritime Academy program with a Bachelor of Science in Marine Engineering, uh, license option program. So I graduated with a third assistant engineer license. Um, my first employment was the training ship. Um, I had agreed to go on that after I graduated and before they, uh, they were having a hard time getting people on it. When the union called me, um, it was, come work for us, we got money, you can earn real money, not, not the training ship, and I told them if my work's not good now, when would it be? And I said I'd see them in uh, August, um, so August of 91 is when I started working for the union, and I shipped out of my license, uh, gradually went to uh, Shoreside working in the office, and I worked dispatcher for many years, uh, was added responsibilities to a representative, which meant I went to go visit the ships. Uh, not just put people on them, go you know, visit the ships, check everybody out, make sure there's well visits, any grievances, any problems, and I took care of those. And then um, the branch agent I worked with uh, wasn't going to run for office, so I did. And uh, I moved on to branch agent, took more and more responsibilities, and I was recently elected to the uh, Gulf Coast Vice President position. And our union uh, was established in 1875, and I am the first. Vice President Female. Um, as stated, my name is Sherry Hickman. I'm a pilot on the Houston Ship Channel currently. I've been there 23 years. I graduated from Maine Maritime Academy in 1985. <laughs> <laughs> um, started working as a third officer for a company, uh, Marine Transport Lines. Worked my way up to second officer with them in two years. And the following seven years, I worked for a company called Keystone Shipping Company. Um, <clears throat> um, I was the first female master for that organization, um, bringing the ship usually on the, on the East Coast, but I, I did go around the world. Um, so when I was master, I was master of the uh, tanker Coronado, and I was pregnant with my daughter. And when I got off the ship, I was six and a half months pregnant with her. I was fortunate enough that the Houston pilots had um, interviewed me two weeks after getting off the ship and hired me. Um, so I was the first female that the Houston pilots hired, um, and they had been in operation for 73 years at that point. Um, I started training when my daughter was 18 days old. I named her after the ship, so her name was Coronado. Uh, <laughs> so now I've been here on the Houston Ship Channel for 23 years. We have four ladies um, out of 97 men right now, which I'm very happy to be able to say we have four now. Um, hopefully some more soon. 
<laughs> Lindsay, uh, Lindsay docks and undocks me on the harbor tugs, and she does a fabulous job doing that. So, um, and I guess my my greatest uh, accomplishment thus far in my life, though, has been my child, Coronado, is now sailing as third mate. She graduated from the same academy that I did in 2016, and she is. Um, Sailing as third mate as we speak. Hello, everybody. Um, I apologize in advance. I have a scratchy throat, so I'm going to be talking a little bit while I'm talking. Uh, first, thank you to Houston Maritime Museum for having this event. I was just reading an article today where they were talking about how important it is to talk about women in maritime because of the just the gender person difference in this industry. So thank you for doing this and thank you for showing up and it's, it's good to know that there are so many people actually interested in knowing and learning about this. Uh, so as she said, my name is Samina Mahmood. I work for O'Brien's as Director of Communications. I've been in Maritime about eight years and I've worked for about like six or seven different companies from that time period. But that is within one company I moved around a whole lot. Um, I got into the industry just by luck and uh, a very good luck, I would say, because I really um, enjoy this industry, really fascinated by this industry every single day. Uh, I used to work in finance industry, and I knew that there was something that was not right being in that kind of role. So I took a sabbatical for six months, and once I started looking for jobs, uh, Crowley Maritime, um, which is a huge Jones Act um, company here in the United States, <coughs> Uh, they gave me a call. They were pretty much the first one to interview me, and they hired me as a marketing analyst, uh, which, again, it was a very different industry that I was um, entering into. But <clears throat> it's, it's, from there on, I just moved to several different positions uh, within the company. Um, after working in the Houston office, I was recruited by their salvage organization, Titan Salvage, in Florida. So I moved to Florida, and I worked with them. And I worked on some really fascinating projects around the world, get to travel the world. Um, the largest project I worked on was Costa Concordia, which is the largest recruitment project the, ever undertaken. Uh, so I was part of that. So there were very challenging role, uh, role that I had to deal with in that organization, but it was just such a fantastic experience. I don't think I would ever trade it for anything else. Um, and after that, they needed somebody to run an organization, again, it is all within Crowley, um, that was uh, basically providing the salvage and marine firefighting services in the United States for the Open 90 regulations. Um, and they needed somebody to head that organization. So they moved me to Houston and they said, we want you to head it. I'm like, okay. And I did. <laughs> and, uh, again, again, very interesting um, experience because I had to deal with a lot of international ship owners around the world. Again, get to see the world, get to meet some fascinating people in this industry. Um, and then um, I exited that company and then started with O'Brien's, which is my current job, and I work as the director of communications. So I, I do not really have any impressive maritime background like these ladies do. But I think I've, I've done pretty okay <laughs> being in this industry. And I think I'm so glad that I took the sabbatical and I took that break and I applied for something uh, that really turned into a great experience of my life. Um, and I think one thing about this industry that I really cherish is that there is always an opportunity to learn. If you are curious and if you're willing to learn and if you're willing to work hard, uh, there and there's just so many opportunities in this industry and also uh, it is so global. So I think it's, it's I, I enjoy my career in this industry and I, I hope most of you are planning to be in it or have been in it and enjoy it as much as I do. Good evening everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. The maritime business is a pretty interesting industry. And so we hope to inform you a little more today, no matter where you're coming from. My name is Joy Hall, and I work at ConocoPhillips, which is an energy company. They actually have a shipping arm, which is called Polar Tankers. And those vessels, there are five that go from the north slope of Alaska, carrying crude oil, 
down to the West Coast refineries, to Hawaii, <coughs> and then to Singapore and, and Southeast Asia occasionally. I also graduated from Texas A&M at the Maritime Academy in Galveston 23 years ago. After having worked in healthcare, I have a Bachelor of Science in Psychology and a Bachelor of Science in Marine Transportation. So a lot of people laugh and say, wow, those two are kind of related. And I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when you work as a girl on a ship. They're in much in need, you know. And so uh, when I got out of school, I went ahead and worked in the Gulf of Mexico as a third officer. And I did ship-to-ship -ship transfers. That's when two ships line up next to each other and they pass cargo, which is typically crude oil or some other type of product for the larger ships that can't make it into port. And after I did that for a while, I became an officer at the, Maritime, at the American Maritime Officers Union and I worked on ships all over the world. I worked in Southeast Asia a lot, off, down in Australia, in the Med, and then I finished my career in the Middle East. So I sailed for 10 years through a chief mate's position, and I held an unlimited master's license. And then, there's a little girl in the back that's 13 now, she's mine. When she showed up, I went ahead and went shoreside, and I started working on a paddleboat boat, and then my current job now for 11 years has been at ConocoPhillips Polar Tankers. And I've been able to transition ashore, and still stay plugged into the industry with all these wonderful people in the room. And what I'm doing now is talent management and ensuring credentials for people that sail on ships, making sure that they have the regulatory requirements and that we have talent and, and skills for people operating safely around the world on our ships. So it's a great job for me. I love it because I love helping people. And I go around and I mentor at the Maritime Academies, all five or six of them on, in the US. And I'm constantly helping people understand what it is that they can do in this industry, whether it's work with your boots and coveralls on or going up and working in a corporate office someday managing a particular part of the maritime business. So if you guys have any questions, just let me know afterwards. Thanks. Good evening. I'm Captain Lindsay Price. I currently work for a GNH towing company based out of Galveston, Texas. I am a 2007 graduate from SUNY Maritime College, and I kind of fell into the industry. I'm originally from Colorado and went to New York City for school and didn't know much about the maritime industry. Figured it out when I went to the Maritime College, and by the time I graduated, decided that I love the sea and I love sailing. So I took a job offer with GNH Towing Company. I've been there for ten and a half years now. I was the first female officer employed and also the first female officer promoted to captain within the company. I currently um, run on board one of the brand new tugboats that we have. She's about a year old now. And I spearheaded her from the time that she was in the shipyard all the way through delivery. <coughs> Um, I have a quick video to show you that show is what my day-to-day -day job is. And as Captain Sherry said earlier, I work with her day in and day out on the job. I'm not sure this afternoon, so you might want to talk during it. Okay. 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 okay, so here, this is um, my tugboat is sailing a ship from one of our terminals called, called Barber's Cut Container Terminal. And so the pilot, like Captain Sherry, would be on board directing me what to do. Um, Lindsay, show them what your tug is, because they may not even realize that. So th this is the tug right here. This is what I'm on. I'm on this, this vessel right here that's pulling the ship out. And as you can see, there's a couple other tugboats. There's one in front of us that's going to go get this other ship going into the Barber's Cut Terminal. <coughs> And in this video, you see about five different vessels, and this video was recorded in one hour period. So that's how busy the Houston Ship Channel is, um, especially at this terminal, the, the Barber's Cut Terminal. Does the tug actually move the big ship? Yes. Is, how much? I mean, it's like so small. It's got big engines, I understand, but 
A lot. A lot. Sure. A lot. <laughs> it really does. Huh? Yes. And the slower yeah. our speed on the ship, the more she can move us. It's like the pit bull of the ocean. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> <laughs> They're a great extra rudder. Yeah. So how many of them usually pull it in? I mean, do it just one or maybe a, I've seen them sometimes there's two or three around. Generally there's two. <laughs> sometimes one, sometimes three. We'll ask more questions afterwards. Okay. Sorry about that. He wants a mic. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I graduated from a and in the late 70s. <laughs> um, I'm one of the first generation of females to sail. I started my career in the same path that Joy did on the tankers that were hauling the first uh, crude oil that came out of Alaska down to the west coast ports, Panama. At that time, um, we could not export Alaskan oil, so we stayed pretty much in, in the States. So. I also did that for 10 years. Um, then a little thing called the Exxon Valdez came along. Um, and that put big oil and oil transportation and everything on everybody's radar. But big oil really didn't know how to react to it. There was a lot of stuff coming down the pike. And after having been instructed um, by my then captain that I was to forge overtime sheets, which was my license hanging in the rack, I decided maybe this is not for me. And at the same time, the state of Texas had just had two catastrophic oil spills, the Apex Barge in Galveston Bay and the Mega Borg offshore. So they were in the process of uh, writing and passing their own oil spill legislation. So on a whim, I just said, look, you know, if you're going to regulate the industry, you need somebody that knows the industry. And they literally hired me on the spot. Said, okay. And I spent the next 10 years working with industry because what we knew is that the state of Texas, oil transportation, petrochemicals and all that, it's vital to our livelihood. We could not go out on the limb and shut the industry down. So we had to find a common ground somewhere. Uh, there were some states that had gone out earlier that literally shut down oil transportation to, to some of their ports in the state. So I got to walk the fence between the regulations and, and the industry for, for 10 years, and then I had a chance to go back into the private business. Um, and you heard Joy talk a little bit about ship, ship transfers, STS. Um, I have been doing that now for like the last almost 20 years. So. Um, it's very interesting. It happens 60 miles offshore, um, but that's how the majority of the foreign oil gets to all the, the various ports. So um, I gained expertise in that, and then my company realized, oh, you know, she knows this. So I helped them put together a safety management system as well as a quality management system to make sure that that operation is done as safe as possible, and we don't have any Exxon Valdez's offshore. And we, we haven't had, so I like to say I had a part in that. Um, so, and I now work for Saudi Aramco, and the majority of their oil, which comes over, is also uh, transferred in the same way. So, and as part of doing that, they said, well, you do such a good um, job auditing, they also have me now doing business resiliency. Um, and if you drive around the corner of 610, you will see that that's our building that we lost during Harvey. So I had to relocate over 500 employees, find them places to work, and we're also in the process of trying to find a new place to work. So it's an interesting transition, but you know, it just, for you up and coming, you know, your career path doesn't have to be this way. You can do all these little jobs. And I guess if I had to give anybody any advice it's have fun doing what you're doing when you're no longer having fun it's probably time to re-examine what you're doing so i just recently went to texas a.m about a week and a half ago and talked to all the cadets and 
it was interesting. I was talking to them about competencies and skills that they needed in order to work in our industry. And one thing, as I was looking out into a big auditorium, there were about 200 cadets in there, and there were hardly any ladies. When I went to school, there was probably 35, 40 percent women. Like she said, she was one of the first in the 70s, late 70s. They were the first. Sherry was probably one of the first at her school as well. When I came along, the path had already been paved, but. It seems like today there are fewer women out there. And in the fleet that I work in, there's 300 employees out there, really a handful of ladies. There's not more than two to four percent of women working on ships worldwide. And two percent of those are, or it, of, you know, of the four percent, about half work in the cruise industry. So they're cooking or they're cleaning rooms. They're not in a capacity as an officer or a high level functioning, you know, employee on board ships. So we'd love to see you guys tell people about us today and encourage them to join the academies, to enter the business in some way. And we are always up here speaking and all over the U.S. speaking to young ladies about joining the industry and about anyone entering the industry because it's a great place to be whether you want to stay out there for a long time or whether you want to just do it for a short period to move on your way to something else. We've heard each of us tell our story so many times we could probably tell each other's story <laughs> if they were absent. And I just want to point out, and of, the, in, of the women in the industry, it's even a smaller number in the engineering department. Uh, this is something that I like to encourage, and because I am one, uh, I was the only graduate in my class uh, to go for the license option engineering program. So when the union called the school during the, you know, it was the uh, beginning of the Gulf War, and they were looking for all the graduates in the engineering department, they got my phone number, and uh, that's why they were calling looking for me, and I was having to tell them I'd see them in August. Um, and it's it's one of those things if you have someone who's interested in, in the math and sciences engineering is a great career it's a great way and it's not just limited to shore side there's all the fun of maritime which allows you to travel they pay you to travel which is, is really cool um, <laughs> Am I wrong? No, no you're right. right. <laughs> they, they pay you. You're traveling while working, and then you get some time off, and you get to go go play around. Sometimes. <laughs> Less than it used to be, but still a lot of fun. So um, if you know of any women interested in the STEM programs that are out there, in, in Sea Scouts and Venture Scouts, which I talk to a lot also, um, they, I encourage them for engineering. It's a great career field. And one of the things I will say is I think this is one of the few industries where everybody knows everybody and they all take care of each other. It's, it's a very close industry. Even today, I'll make a phone call and I go, I know that voice somewhere. And we eventually get it figured out. But um, it's just one of those industries where, um, you know, once you, you know, make a connection or something like that, you almost always stay connected. Um, so, you know, for whatever reason you decide to move on or, you know, you're making this job or that job, somebody's always there to mentor you, offer you advice, offer you a job, you know, whatever. It, it's a very accommodating industry. Most people think of it as, you know, standoffish and aloof because they don't understand it. And it's, it's just not that way. Tell us why you chose to do it. Maybe we can all tell everybody. <laughs> Well, I was like Lindsay. I came upon it by chance. I went to A&M at Galveston. I was going to be a marine biologist. Um, I was on a work study program, and the oil company that was sponsoring my work study program pulled the funds and said, if you can graduate by May, you're good. I said, I've only been here a year. I can't <laughs> <laughs> like, graduate. What are you talking about? So associated with the the college is the, the maritime program. And I said, well, if I go over there, I only have to pay $5 an hour instead of the 27 I was paying an out-of-state tuition. So I said, okay, I'll be a sailor. <laughs> and I called my dad that night and said, um, 
I'm not going to be a marine biologist, I'm going to be a sailor. And I think my mom had to pick him up off the floor. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a question. What During the, as a group, you've seen the change, you know, huge changes in the industry. Can you tell us a little bit about where you think, I mean, where the things have really, really improved and where things are still sticking and things are just not evolving the way they should based on you know, the, the business that's out there. I mean, it's, you started one way where you were like the first, the only person in your class. Where, where would you? So the advantage of being in a, a union, which uh, where I started, is you're not getting a job based on your gender or your color of your skin. There is no bias there. Do you have the license? Are you qualified to take this job? And so there was a lot of that pressure of, um, I'm female, I have to, this attitude was out there. I'm female, I have to do better just to get the same respect these guys did. And after a while, I realized that's, of course, patootie, you know, <laughs> can't say that, yeah. Um, and it's just not right. And um, some of that came from some advice that some of the guys gave me, which was right before I went to a ship, it, it was don't take any ship. Um, and I realized I really didn't need to. Uh, I have the license. I have proven myself. I have confidence I can do the job. I'm go I've got a good work ethic. I don't have to prove it to anybody. I just need to do my job. And so that's been one of the really great things about this industry is it's, it's based on, or at least from what I've seen, it's based on what license do you hold? Are you qualified for the job? And it doesn't look at anything else. And that's been a big step for me to say confidently and move to the next step um, or get pushed to the next step which was this last election but you know that's that's that but that's interesting because that's not an all industry so that's very unique in many ways that if you really have if you have a license if you're qualified that you don't have the, there aren't the prejudices that there might be in other industries it sounds like oh no they're there <laughs> but I don't have to play into it. <laughs> I know I, I agree with with her completely, and I think one of the holdup probably is for women getting into this industry is that it is a male-dominated industry, so perception is a little bit different. But I think last time that we were together, we talked about about our mentors. It was very funny that all of us, well, most of us, said that our mentors were actually male in this industry and they are the one who helped us get to the point that we are at. So maybe that's the holdover. where women are like maybe they cannot make it in this industry but actually obviously there, there are prejudices, there are like weaknesses, oh, yeah. there, are, there are some you know sexist attitudes, you have to deal with that no matter what industry you're in. But that's, that's one good thing is that if you prove yourself and if you have the right licenses and you know right attitude you can really make it very well. Oh, no, sure. Yeah, no. <laughs> well, I think, too, is awareness. Um, we speak because there's so many, I mean, I've gone to high schools where originally they were like, oh, this is just for, for the guys. The girls aren't <clears throat> going to listen to this. And I'm like, no, that's why I'm here, because they don't, they're not even aware that the industry is A, there, or B, if they are aware of it, they don't realize that it is open to them. It's not only... Uh, an all-male academy anymore and it's been that way for quite a while as we know but they still education and awareness is is why we do a lot of what we do our our speaking and whatnot so that the girls are aware that it is available to them and I guess as far as where you say where have we advanced where haven't we advanced um, a lot of a lot of the ladies that sail uh, end up meeting somebody in the industry it may not be on the ship they're on, but they need someone in the industry. I did. I My husband was an engineer. But what most of the time happens, if they're both sailing, one of them has to stay home and the other one's going to keep working. And it's usually the female that stays home because she's probably going to have the children. Or if they're going to have children, she will be the one to have But that's why... <laughs> Because of that, not because they don't want to, because 
the choice was either stay home, and I'm not saying it was a forced choice, it was a mutual choice, but that's why you don't see them advancing, because they've met somebody that is in the industry that they're, that they like and understand. But so they're, they're, that's that's where we have become stagnant as far as I'm, as far as I see. Like there's pilot organizations that are kind of being pushed. Like you need to get a minority, and they're talking about a female. But if they don't have anybody applying there, they can't they can't hire somebody if they haven't applied there or if they're not uh, yeah, qualified. So you know it might look like it's an all male organization, but because nobody's Nobody's a, no female has applied, so therefore they can't even hire one. So that's that's where we're still kind of staying a little stagnant. In regard to opportunity, so when I worked out on the water at sea for ten years, I did an operations role. You know, I moved cargo, whether it be liquid cargo or boxes of cargo or cars or whatever it was, heavy lifts. That's what I did, an operations role, and I. As I was out there, I didn't realize that when you come ashore, a whole range of things come into your vision and allow you some new opportunities. So when I started working for an oil company that had a shipping firm, you know, I could do project management work for marine related projects like Arctic technology, how to bury a pipeline there, how to work on offshore platforms and use all the vessels that play into that operation. Uh, I was allowed to do so many things like open LNG facilities around the United States that hadn't been done in probably 30 years. And so when you come ashore, if you are someone that says, yes, I will, yes, and you have your credential and you've had some operations experience, they'll allow you to move around into these really cool roles. And then over time, when you work for a global company, you can work wherever you wish. You just have to tell them every year what it is that you'd like to do. And they line you up and they introduce you to people that can get you there. And, you know, now I'm doing exactly what I love to do is working with people on ships. I know what they do. We can talk the same language. And I help them to get to a better place in life. And one thing what Aaron said is the wages are commensurate whether you're male or female in our industry, whether you're a female pilot or a male pilot or a tug captain that's male or female, we're all making the same amount, which is awesome. I don't know of many other industries that allow that. And I just wanted to say, in my time uh, at my company, g and I've seen that a lot of my male coworkers are more accepting of females. So I was the first female officer, and they were kind of on eggshells around me when I first started, but now, you know, I've, I've been around for a while, so I'm just one of the other guys. And we currently have eight females working at G&H, which is more than we've ever had, so I think it's great. I bet we have lots of questions. Do you, are you guys ready to... How is getting into a maritime academy different than getting into a university, regular university? Um, the Maritime Academies are different in the choice of, of uh, program that you're in. So Texas Maritime, I'm going to take it from, from that basis, uh, Texas Maritime is part of uh, Texas A&M and the Galveston location is their Maritime Academy. It is not the only people that attend that, that campus um, and so there are people that are getting a engineering degree that are not licensed options. So they're the same courses that I'm in, but I'm taking additional courses that get me to shipboard work. And I take a summer uh, trip on ships to get my training on the shipboard experience. Uh, my, I transferred in from another university. Um, I, I was, went out of state because, you know, older brother and sister still lived at home and I was going to college and said, if y'all won't leave, I will. <laughs> um, so I went to a, a, a university up in Washington State and it's the same thing. You have to apply. It's the same as getting into any other academy, any other university. You still have to take general university requirements. You still have to work towards a degree program. Uh, I, I too also changed from marine biology, um, but I went to marine engineering and uh, that was just because my mother's advice said study something that interests you, you don't have to work at it all your life. 
Um, and so it, it interested me. I changed majors. <clears throat> Just like somebody else going to any other university that's still trying to figure out what they want to do. You can change a major, you can change a direction. Uh, the academy just has a couple of extra steps that you need to take if you're going to be a licensed option. You're also in the, at A&M, you're in the Corps of Cadets. I think uh, SUNY has uh, the State University of New York, Fort Schuyler. They also have uh, different degree programs that you don't have to get your license for. Uh, there are six state academies and the Federal Academy, and I think the Federal Academy is everybody's licensed option. I don't think they all go to C, though. Yeah. No, not anymore. So, no. yeah. okay. That's pretty much the same. Yeah. Make a major. <laughs> all right. Questions? Uh, it's been touched upon a lot about the uh, lack of visibility of uh, women in the uh, maritime industry. Uh, but yet, I've met you know many graduates from California Maritime you know that went into the Navy. These are those maybe they have gone to the defense route, such as like say, you know merchant maritime or the military. And if so, how much interface have you had with say the defense side of, it, of the maritime industry? I can answer that. <laughs> I used to work on a preposition ship, and it carried military cargo for the Marine Corps, and so. <coughs> floating warehouses out in different ocean regions and I happen to work out in the Pacific and then I worked out in the Med in the Middle East for a while and the only time I saw females um, from a defense position were from the Navy we have their Navy staff on board and they'd be there listening for submarines and doing um, different staff jobs for the Navy but I guess I don't, I don't know do have you guys worked with anybody in the, in the military or defense side of things? Um, one of the things that I did when writing the regulations was I spent a considerable amount of time actually working with the Coast Guard in Washington, D.C. So um, the Coast Guard is probably one of the few um, military uh, entities that does have a fair amount of females actually in the Coast Guard. Um, they go to the Coast Guard Academy or they, they come in as uh, officer candidates and go to officer candidate school. And for their first two tours, they are expected to serve shipboard. After that, they're ju just like with any of, of the other military, there there's a whole lot of options open for them. But obviously, the Coast Guard being maritime-centric, it basically, most of it has to do with, you know, um, safety of ships, uh, pollution response. Um, we're, very heavily into cybersecurity, so um, I can only speak with the Coast Guard side. I haven't had have had interaction on um, on the Navy side. Um, I will say there's probably not as many females on the Navy side, um, and then we we do have an, an arm which is known as the Military Sealift Command, um, and there there are a large number of uh, females. And that's um, a group of privately held ships that operate in government service, just like Joy was talking about. They take troops and um, tanks and whatever else is needed, you know, over to uh, conflict areas and sometimes not non-conflict areas. Um, I did have the opportunity to serve on one of those ships, and I did not like Diego Garcia. <laughs> <laughs> I did. <laughs> Sorry, I did. Um, I, I actually say that we have a higher number of females in our NRTC SSMP unit on campus than we do in the actual core on campus. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, and where, did, where does that take you? The NRTC SSMP unit? Uh -huh. So NRTC will go active once they graduate in the Navy, and SSMP will be reserved whenever they go into the Navy, or when they graduate. Right. And I think most of the academies do have a um, ROTC unit in addition to their midshipmen unit. So midshipmen are, are oriented more towards the civilian maritime life, even if it's through MSC, Military Sea Lift Command, those are still civ civilians. And then the ROTC is more directed towards the um, armed services. And you'll have many of them transition to there. And all of the state academies offer um, a direct commission um, either into the Navy um, and, and the Coast Guard will also take some, some direct commission in. And it, it all has to do with how you set yourself up within the academy uh, and all of that. So 
you know, once you're with, within the, the college and or academy regime, um, that they're, just like Aaron was saying, that there's places you can move back and forth. I want to hear more about this option about staying home and going to work. <laughs> <laughs> I'll share some Sherry. <laughs> So that's not always an option on choice. <laughs> We've got one more question. Yes. Um, I want to know a little bit more about the licensing procedures for people who don't want to go the academy route. Uh, a lot of licensing requires time on the water. So have any of you gone the bootstrap method of going to work for a company, experiencing and gaining your time on the water while at sea towards getting a master captain's license? And that company that you're working for is paying for your uh, education as well towards a higher Carl, career. Carl Hall's yeah. Jill, yeah. Jill, do you, you want to take school. this hand, this question? Yeah, sure. sure. <laughs> Jill yeah. Friedman is also a WISTA lady, so WISTA yeah. sister. Yeah, hi, WISTA sister. I was going to ask that question myself because I'm going to make you answer it. <laughs> Everybody seems to be really concentrating on the. Uh, college route and academy, but there's a lot of ways that you can do it without going that route. So I, I did that way. I worked my way up. I actually, I did go to school for the two-year program here um, in Texas. I moved here. This was back in 78. Back then, there were no women out there at all. I fought tooth and nail for every job I got, but um, I came here to go to school because people kept saying, oh, you're a girl, you can't do that. You can't be out here on the boat. So I came over here, I said, if I get my AB ticket, my Q minute to work in the engine room, then the Coast Guard says I can do it. I have a license to prove it, so I can do it. So I did do a two-year program. I did one year, and I ran out of money. So I had to uh, work. So I would work and save my money and go back to school took me five years to graduate that two-year program, and I worked my way up. I got my 1,600-ton um, master. Excuse me, I'm nervous. Um, <laughs> I put her on the spot. <laughs> so, um, worked on uh, crew boats and fly boats, and smaller vessels out here in the Gulf of Mexico, and uh, I worked 1,600-ton uh, master. The Coast Guard changed the rules, so I had to go back. I said it was AB. Um, able-bodied seamen, deckhand on the tankers, going up to Alaska. I did that for about 10 years. I got my third base license. Um, then I, I uh, worked for a company that wound up going out of business. So um, then I got into the oil field again. I got my dynamic positioning certificate and uh, got my second mate working for um, oceaneering, um, dive vessels, and uh, did that for a while and then Worked my way up. I wound up having to take all these classes for SDCW. They're like a week or two at a time. Mm -hmm. And uh, earned my chief mate's license that way. And uh, eventually got my captain's, my master of limited. And uh, so basically nobody really paid for me to go to school. I paid every penny myself. So it can be done. It takes longer. Um, but it definitely can be done, and if you just want to get out there and be on the water and, and do the work, um, that's a good way to do it. I really love my job. I love being out there, and uh, I've been more than 40 years out there, and I still really love it. I can't think of anything else that I would rather be doing. So wow. that's definitely awesome. As a training director, I help people get their credentials, and we don't just see people from the Maritime Academies, but there are some technical academies like Seattle Maritime, Resolve Maritime, the Northeast Maritime, and they're, they're bringing people into the program with two years from a pretty much an uh, entry-level position, and then they're having to do what Jill did. You know, they're having to go and take all these extra classes it's going to cost you a lot of money these days and a lot of time. It's almost easier to go the academy route, no matter how old you are. We see cadets of all ages a long time ago. All the cadets were under 30 years old. I was one of the older cadets when I started out at the academy because I had already gone to school. 
and worked for a long time. And when I decided to do that, I was older. But we even see people in their 50s out there just starting at the academy. So there's lots of entry points. It just depends on what you want to do and how much time and money you want to spend. I know there are two or three high schools that now have maritime, um, like magnet schools. How high a, a, a level can they get to before they graduate from high school, do you know? They're here. I want to hear oh, that answer. Who wants to touch that? All right. There you go. Uh, Jeff, you want to I only heard part of the question because I'm high school level. At the high school level, how high a, a license or uh, a, what proficiency can they reach by the time they uh, graduate from high school? Actually, it, it, that entry experience is, is what we shoot for, and, and certifications in, in, uh, in industry, whether it be logistics, um, cert certifications to help them pursue the engineering side. That's actually the side that I teach here at uh, Austin High School. Um, but the problem is, is the TWIC regulations and enforcement of TWIC and getting them the, the being 18 um, is a whole different thing. Retired Coast Guard. So a whole different thing on what the regulations say is 16 and then what they enforce is 18. But um, so when you get into TWIC regulations or, or even um, a lot of the, the CFRs even just driving in logistics driving, driving forklifts. So basically what we shoot for here locally is to get them some certifications, get them experience, bring the students to things like this, get them exposure, and then um, just engineering wise we get them you know, certifications on engines and hydraulics and things of that sort. So, so, so we'll make right it correct. correct. They'll, they'll be able to have an easier time at taking the test and everything. I mean, ultimately, our goal is to shoot for QMED, say engineering wise, shoot for QMED. Um, the problem we run into is C time and certain things, and like I said, tweak. And, and for those of you who don't know, QMED stands for Qualified right. Member of the Engine Department, and so that's an entry level position. Um, a, 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 it's more than the uh, uh, just the wiper that's in there to clean. It is a qualified member, so getting that qualification is important for uh, being promoted. And their seat time with a QMED uh, certificate works towards their advancement, towards getting their uh, engineering license. So um, it's a matter of days on a ship while holding the credential at that point to move on up. And then with that real quick too, just on the side note, is, is it's ever progressing, just like industry or anything else. Is, is you know we have our goals and what we're looking out for so even on our deck and operations side that we teach over here at Austin is we have a half million dollar uh, simulator um, up there currently right now it's not Coast Guard certified so we can't give them seat time but we're working with Sand Jack and a few others so a lot of its contacts in the industry and getting backing and support and working with them on on their <laughs> lobbyists and everything else to try to get that locally Houston being you know a huge for the largest city and, and one of the largest tonnage ports in the nation. So, uh, You've heard us talk a lot about STCW, that's the standards of uh, watch keeping and certification. <laughs> and, and, and those are international standards. Those are throughout um, whatever country is sending seafarers to sea, they have to meet those standards. So these are not U.S. centric standards. The problem is, is they tend to get piled on. So when I graduated um, and I was moving up through the ranks, um, when I moved from second mate to third, I mean from third mate to second mate, I had to take the week long exam, had to renew my radar, um, I had to get a physical. Well, by the time I was even considering my master's license, which would have been in the late 80s, um, you know, now we're into drug and alcohol testing and all this. And then we have the Exxon Valdez and a couple more things. And then STCW came along. So there are probably eight to ten one-week courses that they have to take and get an additional certificate in that goes along with licensing and moving up. And you heard Jill talk about how difficult it is. You just get that group done and a new set of regulations comes down to you. So it's an ever-changing environment, um, and it's it's very hard to predict because it is internationally driven. So 
and it, it's one of those things you know unfortunately a lot of the investigative bodies think that the problem with all these ship accidents is the people behind them so they keep saying oh well we got to make the people better well you know people are going to be people and things are going to happen um, but you know in, in the shipping industry that's just unacceptable so you know we've about unengineered or re-engineered all our ships and I guess now we're going to have autonomous ships so, <laughs> so I don't think they'll get there but where do all these certificates come from talking about it must be a thousand and one something <laughs> <laughs> sounds like it but I have yeah. a clue as a mariner you'll have a binder a three ring binder of certificates from firefighting to you know jumping in a pool doing basic training to reviving people to security i that's what i do i make sure people have every single credential yeah, but based on their billet yeah, but uh, the, the coast guard approves approves a lot of the courses <clears throat> and you know the the international maritime organization requires us as mariners globally to have certain basic training skills and depending on the billet that you serve in and the type of vessel that you're on and the company that you work for and if the company has is a contractor you have company standards you have maybe some government entity standards you have local standards and requirements if you operate especially on the west coast of the u.s so it's funny when I went to A&M uh, about 10 days ago, I showed them, you know, what it looked like for them in their curriculum for four years. And then I said, that's four years. And it gives you the credential that you get from the Coast Guard. And then I showed them, if you come to the company I work at, what you need to take to get certain certificates. And then what you need to take as a corporation and what you need to take when you're going to just work on those ships specifically and it's it's a plethora of training training train 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 and you do it annually you know every five years some of it's every you know every year or so lots of training and so one of the differences between like the Haas Piper or the Maritime Academy is when you go to the Maritime Academy you are already set up to take all these courses and by the time you graduate you have all your STCW courses completed if you go the Haas Pipe way, you're responsible on your own to figure out which courses need to be taken, um, where you can take them, and there's certain academies. We have one here, the San Jacinto Maritime College, that a lot of people go to, to that offer these courses, and there's other ones throughout the United States. But also, after you graduate, you have to keep up with the standards because like Trisha said, they keep bringing out more and more courses, and I'm responsible for myself to take these courses. And whether or not my company sends, a, sends me to them, it's still my responsibility for my license to keep it current. One week of training typically costs about $1,000, and that doesn't include your flight and your hotel if you can't take it locally. So every time we send someone to a week of training, it's about $3,000 plus the amount of money we pay them on for their day rate. Now with that, with that in mind, I, I think it was Elliot right there uh, mentioned the Jones Act just a few months ago. Here, there was a gentleman here that gave a talk on the Jones Act. Coincidentally, just in the last couple of weeks, newscasts or what I heard in Congress, there's some talk about repealing the Jones Act. Going, so what is your response to that? It's like, that's out of the blue, and I wouldn't know anything about it unless I'd have been here a couple months ago. So that was, I think, 1920, the so, Jones Act. Yeah, the, so there's the, some things floating around Congress about repealing it. So, the, okay. the, the Jones Act has a couple of different scenarios, and it was not the problem in Puerto Rico. <coughs> Let me say that again. It was not the problem. That's what it came up about. Yes, that's what it came up about. Um, and it was not the problem in Puerto Rico. Please tell your congressman it was not the problem. So the issue with the Jones Act is if you have U.S. goods um, and you're going to pick it up in a U.S. port and deliver it to another U.S. port, it must be on a U.S. flag and crewed vessel and built. I think it's yes. still there. So, um, and we're not cheap, but we're not the most expensive either. 
Uh, the uh, Merchant Marine is an unarmed force for protection zone your, along your coastwise. We are national security as well. We all take an oath when we got our license. Um, and it's, it's not the problem. I mean, if somebody, we've got ships coming in all over the place, they bring goods from overseas and they go from U.S. port to U.S. port to U.S. port, they're not picking up in the U.S. and dropping off in the U.S., so they're not under the Jones Act. Every, company, every country that has their own cabinetage laws, which is what this is, is a Jones Act, is, is carriage of U.S. goods, or our own country goods to our own uh, country. Um, that's what they're there, is their national defense, their own, and they maintain a merchant service. Well, we, we're you know, here in peace and war, and uh, when it comes time to an active war, and you want to carry your logistics for your armed forces, who are you going to want? A foreign flag vessel with foreigners on there. Um, anybody paying attention a few years ago? No, that did not work real well for Canada. Mm -hmm. Their uh, ammunitions were held hostage mm -hmm. for more pay. Um, this is not what you really want. You want to have dedicated U.S. personnel on U.S. ships, making sure your logistical line is, is open. Um, the Jones Act is also, you, I was here for that lecture as well, and it also talked about how it was for the protections for their health and well-being so that they're not abandoned, U.S. mariners are not abandoned overseas. Um, so it's not just the U.S. goods from U.S. place, but that's what's being attacked when it comes to uh, um, you know, the senator from Arizona who I really don't like, so I won't name him. And it's, John McCain. <laughs> I'm, from, I'm from Arizona. Okay, he named him, I didn't. But yes, yeah. um, and it's and, and the Jones Act um, when they waived the Jones Act for the ten days, uh, the maritime industry did get up in arms about it, and we were talking to us, and it's like, look, when it's for humanity, hum, humanitarian aid, we don't stand in the way of that. We're going to promote that. This is our mariners. This is our countrymen who need help. But where's the need? The cargo is sitting there waiting for the infrastructure not for the cargo to get in ports. And believe it or not, uh, one of our members from Puerto Rico just didn't even understand it himself um, because he was saying, well, they, over in Venezuela, they want to bring us aid and they can't. And I'm like, that's not true. They can. But they just can't get it off the dock. So it's not the Jones Act, and it's a, it's a very misunderstood act. And, um, and it's in the news a lot. And I think the waiver kind of stopped a lot of the talk, but now they're talking, now there's... Uh, in Congress, uh, people who are advocating repealing it, and that just would not be good for our national security mm -hmm. either. That's and another part of the Jones Act, or a caveat to it, and probably nobody in here has probably ever even thought of it, maybe the cadets have, but <laughs> the cruise ships, they're all foreign flag. They come into Galveston. They, they can't just go to Florida and New York and come back. They have to go to a foreign port because the cargo is the passengers. So therefore, they can't carry those passengers from one U.S. port to another without going to a foreign port. That's why they go to Mexico. That's why they go to Brazil. That's, they're not doing that because, oh, that's somewhere where people want to go. They have to leave the country. They have to leave the U.S. and take them to a foreign port in order to be able to carry them. Hawaii has American <coughs> cruise ships because they're not leaving Hawaii. Or, and they're Jones Act. And the, so it's Jones Act. The cargo is the, 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 the clients on board. So that's that's part of that's the way the Jones Act works, basically in reverse with the cruise ships. Otherwise, all of our cruise ships would be um, American flag vessels if they wanted to stay just on the coast. But they have to leave the country to be able to carry all these American passengers. Can you talk a little bit about the opportunity? You know, we talked about Houston. That's why. Museum, one of the things we do is try to explain to people that come here that, you know, that are not that familiar. I think there are people that get lost and drive around and make jokes about they drive over 610 and they mm -hmm. look down and go, what is that? That's the ship. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're a port city. We're a huge port city, the largest as far as tonnage in, in the country. What are the opportunities here that, because Houston is such an important port city, what would you say compared to some of the other ports, I mean, are, are the... Uh, um, the opportunities here are just <clears throat> that huge and they're just not filling the jobs? The, the opportunities here are huge. Um, if, you, if you just think about one ship, um, I've, I've spoken to high schools, um, Galena Park for instance, 
they've partnered with Kirby to some extent as well, trying to get kids into entry level. Um, I don't even think they realized, that the children there did not even realize that the ship channel was like two miles away from the school and that there were opportunities for them. Whether Even if you don't go into a licensed field, even if you're not going to sail, that every ship that comes in that has liquid cargo on board has to have a gauger come on board and gauge the cargo and verify how much actually came in compared to what the ship says they're hauling. So that's a job that they could probably... It's a good job. Yeah, and it's a, it's a great job. It's a job that most of those students would even entertain or think was out there for them, and it's a lucrative job for them. They probably didn't even think that was something in their, in their sites. Um, that's just one field, and if you think, we bring, we move 60, approximately 63 ships a day on the Houston Ship Channel. So think about the support system for each one of those ships. Not just, no, and it's, you've got agents, you've got surveyors, you've got uh, not only cargo surveyors, but vessel surveyors. Um, line line, line, line handlers, handlers, the tugs, the, you know, it's just endless opportunity. Well, every container that moves off has to have a truck and a chassis assigned to it. There's a huge logistics and supply chain. I mean, how many of you know that there's basically only three railroad tracks that move in and out of the Port of Houston? Somebody has, has to manage those trains moving back and forth. You know, which train gets priority and, and all of that, you know. You, you can still work in logistics and supply and be the supply coordinator for Walmart. All of their tennis shoes and TVs and that kind of stuff are sitting in a container over in the port. And you're working in Illinois and you got to figure out how to get all that stuff to the distribution center in Illinois. So it, it's, it's huge. So on that note, just because <laughs> all of you ladies, lovely as you are, are talking about blue water and port and ocean going, can you tap into the brown water market for all these young up and coming? Yeah, well, we move, we don't, uh, brown water <laughs> themselves move, the pilots don't get on the, uh, the tug and barges, the smaller ones, um, the ocean going ones we do. But, approximately 350 tug and barge movements per day on that Houston ship channel. So the opportunities there. Now as far as going into that industry, I mean you could go through an academy to do that as well, but also you've got Kirby that has their own training. You've got, um, I'm sure the high schools are um, pushing them in that direction as well, that that's an opportunity for them. Um, you heard so, Jill talk about the various tonnages of licenses. Um, we're all unlimited, but you can work your way up to those lower tonnages in, in less time um, and make very lucrative money. The, the nice thing about brown water or sometimes what we call you know, the, the brackish water is um, your, your time away from home is usually less. You know, sometimes it's a month on and you get two weeks off or something like that where most of us would spend two or three months at sea and, and get a month off. But the, the career path is, is about the same. Um, it's a little bit different in, in the fact that, um, you know, what you're pushing, you know, you, with, with Lindsay, you know, you're normally got a barge, whether it's filled with dry cargo, rocks, or oil, or petrochemicals, or, or whatever. So um, it's, it's very similar. Um, and in fact, if I was giving advice to somebody, I would tell them brown water is the place to be because of the, lo the logistics chain of getting things moved within the, the, the U.S. That is the most difficult part. Getting the big ships into port, that's kind of the easy stuff, but all of these little small cargoes and not you know, I'm just kidding. It, it, it's little really small parcels of cargo. Like there, there are refineries that only need 10,000 barrels of, of this product, but if they don't have it, it shuts down and Goodyear can't make tires anymore. So, um, it's sorry, I didn't mean to throw you off. Yeah. That's, I just that, you, that's you okay. touched on having the railroad in the port, but right. nobody's mentioned our inland waterways. That's yeah. also part of the maritime. Yeah. So sorry. for those of you, uh, the difference from, between blue water and brown water, blue water is going ocean going and overseas a lot and out into the um, international waters. Your brown water fleet is typically your inland, your rivers, your intercoastal waterways. So there's still a lot of work on there. 
um, and it's, it's a lot more movements and again your time home is a lot different the time on your ship is a lot different um, there's bargemen as well as tugs uh, you know so integrated tug barges uh, you might be on a ship because they're connected together but it's actually two different things so it's a lot of different movements and it's a, it's a very busy busy industry we have the intercoastal waterway here then I don't know for the pilots they have to watch I mean that crosses the main uh, channel down there so busy it's so busy, busy it's a very yeah. very busy yeah. intersection and an accident there can stop both yeah, exactly. I just want to promote some of the jobs that I usually fit in because I do not really, I've never sailed except when I was a child. And just, just know that all these companies have a lot of other opportunities too, like for the marketing, for the communications, for commercial purposes that where I fit in. And I call people like these ladies for the technical support and other things. So just know that opportunities. Again, it's a vast industry, like you were saying, and there are other opportunities that are supporting roles uh, for people who are on board. So just think about that. Also, it is not just that you have to go to an academy, and uh, those are the those are the only positions. The the industry is so vast that there are other other opportunities also. Well, and one of the areas we haven't even touched on is ships and cargoes are traded just like stocks. Mm -hmm. So brokers and all of those people are putting all of this together. And that's a huge field. They're always looking for charters, brokers, and, and you know, Samina's kind of started out in that area. But somebody's got to, you know, say, well, you know, I've got 600 tons of this to move and 300 tons of that. And somebody says, well, i got to ship over here. Somebody has to put all that together. And so, someone has to cook. Yeah. <laughs> the most important job on the ship yeah. is the stewards department. Let me tell you, they're non-licensed, but they're vital. We are all part vital. of the Women's International <laughs> Shipping and Trading Association. It's called WISTA, and it's a global association with over 3,000 women around the world. And when we go to some of the events worldwide, it's amazing. The women that you meet and what they do and the titles that they hold, they're a very, very high profile you know, group of women. And so if you guys do anything tonight, I want you to go home and type in www.wista.net and take a look at who exists in the maritime business around the world. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much.